Well, trying, trying to talk about the communication of science in, in 30 minutes, obviously, is like asking you to tell me about your field in 30 minutes. So what I'm going to try to do is distill my observations from the past 25 years of observing programs like IPM and other programs that attempt to change, uh, either change policy or change individuals in how they react and behave. Because ultimately, that's what we're really trying to do, is change behavior. We're trying to change people. And if we don't succeed at that, then we fail. Uh, so, so ultimately, that's our goal. And, and, and that's partly why I say the science doesn't matter. Because what we're really trying to do is not do the science. We're trying to change people. Now, we're trying to use science to make those decisions which I'll, I'll talk about a bit. I really only have three, maybe three and a half points, I'll round it down to three, um, that I want to make today. Because I think those really present the idea of the dilemma that we're faced with. Um, we're faced with an impossible task, and if we don't succeed at that impossible task, we fail. So maybe what I'm going to be saying today is that I think we need to rethink our objective a bit and what it is you're trying to really do. And let me explain what, what I'm talking about with that. 1497, an English uh, sea captain sailed around the Cape of Good Hope with 160 sailors. Halfway th through the journey, a hundred of those sailors had died, died of scurvy. About 25 years later, and that was typical of the time, if you've, if you've read any history. Um, about 25 years later, a sea captain, physician, gave, ha gave the sailors on one of his four ships a teaspoon of lemon juice every day. He had three control ships. Halfway through the journey, he had to transfer sailors from the treatment ship that was getting citrus to the other ones to, to be able to continue sailing. Very clear evidence that citrus prevented scurvy and death. 200 years later, the British Navy finally adopted the use of citrus to prevent scurvy. 200 years later, and there were multiple experiments off and on during that time. It took another 50 some years before the British Merchant Marine adopted citrus. Now I tell you this not to point out that the British are slow in adopting technology. <laughs> that may be true, I don't know. Or to discourage you f that what you're doing is hard. But the point is that if we don't communicate the science effectively, it's useless. It doesn't mean anything. We have to get the science to the right people. And in that case, obviously, it was the hierarchy in the British uh, Navy that didn't work. Now, we can spend, in fact, in my class, we spend a lot of time looking at a lot of these examples. There are examples going on today. How many of you use the, uh, the Dvorak keyboard on your computer? Sure. You probably don't know about it even though it was invented or developed and studied in the 30s, you used the QWERTY keyboard, which was designed to slow you down. Because the old typewriters were so slow that typists would jam the keys. We're still using that keyboard, despite the fact that another design of a keyboard facilitates accuracy, reduces stress, and increases speed. No. 
1930, we knew all of this. We're still not using it. So we're st we still have a lot of things that, uh, that need, to be, need to be worked on. So my point in all of this is that the science, whatever it is we're doing, really doesn't mean anything until we're able to effectively communicate it. Until we're able to get it to policymakers, until we're able to get it to individuals that are going to use it. That has to be our goal. Most of you probably define your job as, what, turf management specialists or entomologists or or water quality specialist, I'd argue that's, that's not what you are. You're really communicators. That's your primary job, is communicators. You are really translators of complex science. And I heard the complexity of, just in this short discussion you had this morning, the complexity of the science you're dealing with. You know, you don't even understand it all. And part of that is because that's the nature of science. We aren't finding the answer. We are continuing to improve our understanding. In fact, I, I blame the physicists for creating a major problem for all of us. The physicists probably for the last 75 years have been trying to convince the American public that they will find the answer. They will solve the problem. Well, the truth is, They've got a lot to learn. In fact, a lot of their theories are being shot today. They're not finding the answer. They're gaining an understanding. The problem is they have convinced the public that science is going to give the answer. And so the public gets upset when they hear, today this is true, tomorrow it's not quite true, it's changed. That's not what the message should be. We should be talking to people about learning more, gaining an understanding. Science is not precise, and it probably never will be. So point one, science must be communicated. Let's move on to point two. This begins adding a bit of complexity. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more just about the idea of risk, because risk is, to some extent, a little bit more complex science. Although I think most science involves uncertainty. Risk is the idea of uncertainty. That we cannot communicate precise, or we cannot say precisely that something will happen or how it will happen, or under what circumstances it will happen. There is uncertainty. We know that 40,000 people are going to die in car accidents this, this coming year. That's about all we know. We don't know where, when, how. You know, we can't be precise about it. That's the idea of, of precision. OK, we're faced with a number of conditions. Number one, the public has limited understanding of science despite the fact that virtually all high school graduates have taken science courses, the evidence is they really don't understand science. Uh, I'm not sure where that failure is happening, but, but somewhere. And even college students coming out don't really understand the true nature of science, I suspect. Second point is that the public has limited attention to science-based issues until they become either high profile or it becomes extremely clear that it's impacting them directly. That's the only time that people really pay attention. And, we, and, and you know this, we all have limited attention spans because we're focused on other things. We have, we have decisions we have to make in our daily lives. We can't be paying attention to all of these issues that in fact are pretty important to us but it's like, well, you take care of that. I have to focus on these other issues. And then finally, it seems to me that certain characteristics of science, and particularly risk, the idea of uncertainty, emphasize the negative. In other words, it leads people to 